place to be. It's been a while since I've been up front, but it's still an awesome sight to see all of you here and to know that there are those, the shut-ins that cannot get here, they can still worship God through the internet by watching us. And I just appreciate everybody. And I would like to hear that. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> and if you're a visitor here, please let us know. We would love for you to join us here in our church as Jesus' home. And please, just thank everyone again for being here. And I'd like to read, start off by reading what our agenda is for this week. And today... Naturally, we have worship service now at 9.30. At 10.30, we have Sunday school for all ages. And there is no FBC kids or youth meetings at 5 o'clock tonight. That has been canceled. Tuesday at 12 noon will be the uh, American Baptist Women's Lisa Simmons Circle meeting. Wednesday, February the 14th, which is Ash Wednesday, there will be 6 o'clock choir, but no Bible study. I would like, we would like to give special thanks to the kids and the youth who made cookies and the deacons for delivering the valentines and cookies to our shut-ins. Our shut-ins enjoyed being remembered by their church family. It is little things that touches the heart. Thanks to everyone who furnished dough and helped with this in any way. Also to the Christian Ed Board members for the wonderful meal, music, and fellowship on Sunday evening at the Sweetheart Dinner. The CE board thanks everyone who attended as well. Be in prayer for Pastor Mark as he will be in class at Parkland Valley this week, Monday through Wednesday. If you have a need, please contact the office, church office and a deacon will be contacting to assist you. If there is an emergency, please call the church office and Kathy will contact Pastor Mark. Those going to see Daniel in Lancaster, Pennsylvania on March 22nd, the $100 deposit needs to be paid to Annika Swisher, Swisher by February 25th. The Broad Run Baptist Church is holding a men's retreat on March 2nd at the Mount Vernon Dining Hall at Jackson Mills. All men are invited to attend. It will be 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. and the cost is free. Breakfast and lunch will be provided. You can register online by going to broadrunchurch.com. On February 22nd, everyone is invited to attend a thank you reception at the Senior Center. It will begin at 1 o'clock p.m. Reminder that the children will be starting Easter play practice next Sunday, February 18th, during extended session. All kids are invited to join them. The youth will also be starting preparing a program soon. Mark your calendar so everyone can be involved. Some Ash Wednesday information. Ash Wednesday is a Christian holy day of prayer, fasting, and repentance. It marks the beginning of Lent, a season of 40 days, excluding Sundays leading up to Easter Sunday. The observance of Ash Wednesday is most common in the Western Christian tradition, including Roman Catholicism, Anglicanism, and some Protestant denominations. Also called by the Day of Ashes, Ash Wednesday starts Lent by focusing the Christian's heart on repentance and prayer, usually through personal and communal confession. This usually happens during a unique Ash Wednesday service. One more announcement. Drivers are needed to pick up folks wanting to attend church. We want to get to church, the church van out into the community so folks can see us working. If you would be willing to take a Sunday of driving the van, there is a sign-up sheet in the educational wing. We've already got February and March covered thanks to Pat and Michelle Botkins and Tommy and Pam Tucker. Now, what I'd like to do is have a time of greeting. Everyone greet. And even those that are watching 
I'll always remember to wave in the back so that they will see us online. And now we will sing our praise hymn, praise him, praise him. <laughs> Before we go to prayer, are there any prayer concerns? Yes, I have one. Uh, my uncle, uh, he was dozing, so we call him Bud. Hey, Bud. Bud Duncan. 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 Andy Clark. Andy Clark. Ralph Miller. Ralph Miller. Pardon? Phil, Phil Nelson, Anna Dean, Kathy Fisher, Bonnie Grog. We have quite a long list of prayer concerns. Anyone else? Denise Mosley. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful opportunity, Lord, to come into your home and speak with you and hear your word. And Lord, just thank you for all that you do, all the blessings that you give. Even though, Lord, the world seems turned upside down right now, we know, Lord, that every day is a blessing 
You give us so much, Lord, that we can never be thankful enough. And Lord, with all the turmoil going on, I keep remembering what Apostle Paul keeps saying through his scripture. I fought the good fight, I ran the race, and I kept the faith. And I know, Lord, that no matter how hard it gets here, As long as we do those three things, we will be sitting beside you, Lord, one of these days, smiling from ear to ear. So, Lord, just thank you for all that you do. And now, Lord, we would like to pray the prayer that your beloved son taught his disciples to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we will have children's chat with Charlie Streets and the preschool second grade are excused to attend the children's church. Hi guys, how are you? Good. Yeah? Everybody happy to be here today? Yeah. Yeah? Good, I'm happy to see you. Have fun. All right, who can tell me what holiday we're going to be celebrating? Valentine's this? Day. Valentine's Day. You and Annika, or Annika, Ali and Arabella are all ready with your Valentine's Day gear, aren't you? Mm-hmm. Right, so when we celebrate Valentine's Day, we see lots of what? Hearts. We see hearts lots of hearts. And Valentine decorations that have hearts. Yep, yeah. we see them at the grocery store, we see them at school. Where else do we see them? Do you know? On your clothes? Yeah? No, oh. and us. Where? <laughs> what about at the library? Do you ever yeah. go to the library and see things hanging at the library ready for Valentine's Day? Yeah. Yeah, we see hearts everywhere. Like she said, we see them on different things. We see them on stickers. This is a heart necklace that Brent made me years ago for Mother's Day. It's a heart that shows that he loves me. We see them on some candies. We even see them on cards. They're everywhere this time of the year. Did you know that in the Bible, it refers to the word heart over 700 times? That's a lot. But when we're talking about heart in the Bible, we're not talking about heart candies or heart stickers. It's talking about our innermost being, the thing that makes us help think and make choices and decisions. God tells us that we have a really big problem with our hearts. Do you know what that is? Mm -mm. We have sin in our hearts. And if we have sin in our hearts, that keeps us apart from God. But, a thousand years ago, long before you were born, he had a plan for the sin in our hearts. He had a plan to send his only son, which is who? God. Jesus. God sent his son, Jesus. And Jesus was not full of sin. He was the only (coughs) human to walk the earth that did not have sin in his heart. He was pure. He helped heal the blind, and he helped heal the sick. He also did miraculous things. He calmed a storm when his friends were in it, when they were terrified, and he died on the cross for our sin. And when he died on the cross for our sin, God promised us if we could put all the sin of the world, oh, my cross is a little funny looking, all the sin of the world on the cross and we could be forgiven. So you would have a clean heart, okay? I could, well, yeah, like his arms spread across. Very good. All right. So before we go, I'm going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, and it says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteous of God. Okay? So when we go back, we're going to talk a little bit more of how we can keep sin out of our heart by asking for forgiveness and then pray. Okay? Yeah. All right, so let's bow our heads and say a little prayer, and then we'll head back. Dear God, thank you for the gift of a new heart. Through your son, Jesus Christ, 
we find salvation. We praise you, Lord, for your endless love and forgiveness that you give us. Help us that when we sin against you, that we come to you and we ask for forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Great. Let's all stand and sing praise him when we all get to heaven, number 468. Would you like to give the offertory prayer?
Let us pray. Dear Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, again, thankful to be in your house and to have this opportunity to be here and to just worship you freely. We thank you for this, this country we live in and the freedom that we have. And, and Father, we just uh, we pray that you would be with our, with our country, our leadership. We pray, Father, that you would uh, be with us here this morning. We thank you for the presence of your spirit with us. And, and Father, we just pray that all things today would just uh, glorify and honor you. Father, we lift up those who have been mentioned today so many in need uh, within our church family and our own families, our community, just so much sickness. And Father, there are those that have lost loved ones this week, and we just pray that you would be with them and comfort them. And Father, all those that need healing, uh, those that have had surgeries and procedures this week, those that are waiting results and facing other, other different procedures, we just pray that you would be with them. And Father, we just pray that for healing, for strength, for comfort, for peace. We pray that you would be with the families and the caregivers. And Lord, we just pray that you would be with us. We pray, Father, for your direction, your guidance, for the leadership of your church here. And Father, we pray that you would just be with our Sunday school teachers and students as we move into the Sunday school hour. We thank you for our youth and our children and those who, who work with them. And Father, we, we just thank you for all of your blessings to us. We pray, Father, that you would just prepare our hearts now for, for your message. And I pray that you would just be with me as I, as I bring your word. Father, that it would be what we are to hear. And Father, that we would just be receptive to that word. Let us grow. Let us grow spiritually. Let us grow closer to you. And, and let us, Father, grow closer to one another. Let us, let us become unified in, in our faith, in our church, in our, in our service to you and, and to our fellow man. And, Lord, just bless us. Protect us. And, Father, go with us as we move into the world. And, and Father, be that, that light of Christ that we may somehow draw the lost to you, to your son. And all these things, Lord, we just pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
How are we doing today? Good, good. <laughs> That's great. It's, it's good to be here this morning. It's good to, good to see some smiling faces there and some faces uh, we haven't seen for a while. It's good to see some of you back that we, uh, we know have uh, had some battles going on. And uh, Thelma and Charlie, it, it, it's really good to see you back. I'm, it's wonderful. I know uh, in visiting with you some of the things you went through, and I know it hasn't been easy, but it's, it's wonderful to see you back today. And I know there's others um, that have had some things going on. And, and we have many in our church family now that are uh, really dealing with some things. So we need to keep all of them in our, our prayers. This is a, uh, a big week. Of course, we've got the Super Bowl today, and I'm really not sure who's playing. Um, I kind of lost, kind of lost interest uh, a couple of three weeks back. Uh, I'm just hoping and praying that uh, this time next year, God sees some some way of, of putting the Steelers in the Super Bowl, <laughs> so that when the when the Cowboys beat them, it'll be doubly sweet. And I know you're not supposed to use the pulpit to, uh, to maybe take a jab at people. That's, that's something we're not supposed to do, but I'm doing it with love, Leanne. <laughs> no, uh, we've, uh, we've got Valentine's Day on, on Wednesday, and there's a public service announcement to you men. Please, please. I know some of your ladies will say they don't want flowers or candy or this or that. It's a trap. All right, it is a trap. Don't fall for it. And uh, also Ash Wednesday, uh, beginning of the Lenten season. So it, it is a it's a wonderful time of year for us as we as we look uh, to Easter. But uh, it's a it's also a wonderful Lord's Day, and it's good to be here today. It's good to have you here. It's good to have those on the the live stream with us this morning. I, uh, yes. Wow. Happy birthday. Helen will be 92 on Valentine's Day. That will be a special Valentine's Day. Absolutely. Happy birthday, Helen. And, uh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. I, I hope Gary there's going to treat you right that day. <laughs> we, uh, we've got some opportunities coming up with the men's retreat and the women's retreat next month. I hope you'll consider doing those things. We had a, a great men's uh, prayer breakfast yesterday. Um, I know the youth have been uh, doing some things as well. There's a, a lot of things going on in the church and and I hope you'll take opportunity and uh, be a part of some of those some of those things. Our uh, sermon today, I'm going to continue with uh, the parables, uh, the parables that Jesus taught, and uh, the parables I'm going to look at today from Matthew chapter nine. Two very short parables, uh, beginning with. Uh, well, we'll start with verse 14 and go through verse 17. This morning, I'll uh, be reading from the New American Standard Bible, chapter 9 of Matthew, beginning with verse 14. Then the, the disciples of John came to him asking, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, The attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. But no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and a worse tear results. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wineskins burst, and the wine pours out, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. Let's pray. 
Dear Father, we, we thank you for your word this morning. And Father, I just pray that as uh, we look just a little deeper at what you have to say, Father, just open our, our hearts to your message, to what Jesus spoke to 2,000 years ago and how that message should resonate with us today. And Father, these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Fasting isn't something that uh, probably most of us do much of today. But it was a, a, a practice that occupied a, a large place in the, in the religious observances of many of the Jews as, as well as, as some others. And it was a, a common religious practice back during the ancient world. The only time fasting was prescribed in the Old Testament law was, was on the Day of Atonement. In the Old, or excuse me, in the New Testament times, however, pious Jews would, would fast on Mondays and Thursdays every week. And, and they would also fast at other solemn times throughout the year and as different events occurred during their life. Whenever they felt like God should be uh, approached in a, in a special way of humbleness and, and humility, uh, in a time of trouble, in a time of need in their life, they saw fasting as the appropriate way to, to start that. And, and the disciples of John the Baptist, they approach Jesus and they say, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but, but your disciples do not fast? And it's likely that the, that the Pharisees instigated this. It's, they, they probably talked the, the disciples of John the Baptist into doing this because they figured that those disciples had more clout with Jesus. Now, regular fasting twice a week plus on other occasions would, would certainly seem to fit the description of fasting often. So, th so these men are saying to Jesus, we, we fast often. We, we fast more than what the, the law prescribes, but your disciples, they, they don't fast at all. I mean, Jesus, what, what's up with that? And, and if you remember, Jesus himself, he, he fasted at the time of his temptation in the wilderness, but there's no there's nowhere in scripture, there's no record where we see that, that Jesus made fasting a regular practice in his life. But John the Baptist's disciples and, and the Pharisees built, built fasting into their, their standard regimen. It was their religious practice and it was far beyond the requirements of the Old Testament law. And although this was not bad in itself, they began to believe that any person who, who fell short of this standard that they set was, was less devout in their faith, wasn't quite as religious as them. Some Christians today, I think we, from time to time, we do the same thing with our own spiritual tests. Maybe, maybe you've done that. Maybe you do that now. Have you ever set certain standards in your mind that you believe a, a Christian must meet in, to be a true follower of Christ? And, and in most cases, what this is, it'll be something beyond what is found in Scripture. It will be something beyond what is generally and, and reasonably accepted by the, the Christian community. Maybe you have certain theological beliefs or interpretations of Scripture that you will absolutely not accept any, any waiver from. And, and this can lead to a sense of superiority and, and judgment for those who, who hold a different view than you do. Maybe you have expectations regarding certain behaviors or, or lifestyle choices, such as abstaining from alcohol or avoiding certain forms of entertainment or adhering to, to strict codes of conduct. Do you, do you find yourself scrutinizing these people? Do you look down your nose at these people who, who deviate from your own set standards? And, and what about spiritual disciplines or practices such as 
maybe regular prayer or, or Bible study and meditation, maybe participation in, in church activities or, or maybe even tithing. Do you see these things as, as indicators of spiritual maturity or, or commitment to Christ? Do you, do you look at those who, who do not engage in these practices to the, to the same extent that you do as less devout or not quite as dedicated to being a Christian as you are? And, and what about those Christians who have different social or political views, political beliefs than you do? Those who hold more progressive views on issues such as abortion, the LGBTQ, the rights, the, the immigration, their rights are, are often ostracized or, or at least questioned about their faithfulness to, to, biblical, to biblical principles. And it's, and it's not that these standards that we, that we have are wrong, right? It's not that they're wrong in themselves. They can be a great indicator, but, but they're not the only indicator. As an example, these, these Pharisees who were boasting of their fasting rituals, and, and they were good at fasting. There's no doubt about that, but they were only boasting because they were boasting of their religion. On the outside, they, they have, may have looked like great men of faith, but they were, they were only great at observing the law. They, they love to, to boast of their adherence to the law. They, they love to boast of their fasting, of their, of their giving. They, they love to boast of their public prayer. But they were actually full of pride. They were full of self-righteousness. They had no, no relationship with God. And yet they collaborated with John's disciples and went to Jesus complaining about the behavior of his disciples. And Jesus, he, he countered their question with a question of his own, a question that anticipates a negative answer. Jesus asked, he said, that he, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? What Jesus is saying here is that the, the bridegroom's attendants, they cannot be fasting while while feasting is taking place, you, you can't mourn and celebrate at the same time. The expression, the, the attendants, it refers particularly to, to that group of wedding guests who, who stood closest to the groom. They played an essential part in the wedding ceremony. These people are focused on the marriage and the wedding. Such practices of as mourning or, or far from their minds when they're getting ready for this, for this celebration. And, and the wedding feast, it could go on for several days, but, but Jesus did not say as long as the, the festivities go on. He says, as long as the bridegroom is with them. He concentrates on the presence of the bridegroom. It's not the, the length of time that's important here. It's the presence of the bridegroom. It's the presence of Christ that matters. Jesus' response to John's disciples was that fasting while he, the, the bridegroom, the guest of honor, is present, it would be inappropriate for fasting to take place. You see the Pharisees and and John's disciples, they, they didn't recognize that, that Jesus was the Mesonaic bridegroom. Their pious sorrow is the sign of the refusal of Jesus and true repentance. They could mourn. They didn't recognize who Jesus was. In the second half of verse 15, Jesus does say that there will be a time when, when fasting will take place. He says, but the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. A time will come when, when fasting among the followers will be appropriate. 
Matthew makes it clear here that fasting was not a practice of discipleship while Jesus was with his disciples, with his followers, but he leaves the way open for it when the days after Jesus would be taken away from them. And Jesus' words, they they point to this future time when when the bridegroom is taken away. And we know there's no doubt that what he means by bridegroom is he's talking about himself. And taken away means his death. Jesus is the bridegroom. John the Baptist referred to him as such. and, And he also referred to him basically as the best man. In John 3, 28, he says, You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. Jesus' statement about being taken from them is is an early indication here in Matthew that he he would not reign during his first coming. And it was difficult for all those around them who were hearing his words to understand that to understand what he was saying. And and it wasn't because Jesus wasn't clear. It was because their eyes were were clouded with their own vision of who Jesus was and and what his purpose was. And you know, we're we're still like that today. As God speaks to us through through his word, through those who, who preach his word, we sometimes, we, we don't hear what he's saying because we refuse to hear anything that contradicts what we already believe. We try to make God in our image instead of allowing God to make us in his image. Here in this verse, Jesus provides a foreshadowing of his his own suffering and death, and as well as the loss and despair of his followers. But few that were listening understood what he was saying. Jesus offered something new. That's the key point of all this. Jesus offered something new, something radically different. To make this point, he shared these these two short parables that we read, the patch and the wineskins. And Jesus, he he begins by referring to a practice in in poor households where patching old clothes was a necessary part of life. And I don't know about you, but growing up, I remember all my jeans had patches on them. And they started out being sewn and they were ironed on later on. And as the holes grew, they became cutoffs and shorts. But he says, no one, no one patches an old garment by using a patch of unshrunk cloth. What's important to note here is is the wear of the garment. It's the wear, it's the the raggedness of the the garment that that matters. It's, It's not what piece of garment it is. The wrong patch, Jesus says, is one of unshrunk cloth. It would be considerably stronger than than the original item, the the cloth of worn clothing. And and a patch of this kind would be most unsuitable. You couldn't use a a new patch on an old piece of clothing. And and Jesus proceeds to explain that such a patch on on such a garment would, would mean trouble. An old garment has shrunk after it has been worn for a while. A new patch of cloth, when, when first washed, would, be, would shrink and be pulled away from the older cloth. And instead of, of mending a bad situation, this, this type of patching would only make things worse. This piece of wisdom would be commonly known by those who were listening to Jesus. And it was a perfect illustration to to bring out the point that that Jesus is is not trying to to patch up a a worn-out Judaism. Jesus was saying this. He was saying something new and unusual is happening. A new era is dawning, and the old methods do not apply anymore. 
Jesus' message of the new covenant was too fresh and, and too vital to be attached to an old garment. And he made the same point with this second example, this time using an illustration of storing wine. He says, nor do people put new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wineskins burst and the, and the wine pours out and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins and both are preserved. Those, those storing new wine which here means that the, the wine is still fermenting. They, they must take care of how they store it. They certainly wouldn't put it in old wineskins. Old wineskins might be okay for old wine, but old wineskins aren't going to, to work when it comes to new wine, when it comes to fresh wine. And when it ferments, it, it gives off gases which, which stretch the wineskins. And, and the new leather, it can stretch and expand. The, but the old leather, it was already stretched as much as it can be stretched. And the old skins lose their elasticity and, and they become worn out. If the new wine is, is stored in old wineskins, the, the process of fermentation, it puts more pressure on the skins and and they can't handle it. And the result is that the, the skins burst. And the wine is lost. And the skins are lost. Fresh wine and old wine skins do not belong together. They just, it will not work. What Jesus, what Jesus was saying with these, with these two parables is that the, the new wine of the new covenant was too vibrant and, and too potent to to be placed in the old wineskins of Judaism. Judaism was too rigid and, and too inflexible to handle it. The situation, it, it demanded a new vessel. And what Matthew recorded here in these verses for us today is, is Jesus hinting at this, this coming announcement of a new approach. And what is this new approach? What what is this new wineskin? Jesus. He's going to deposit this message in a new wineskin. And that new wineskin is the church. He knew that the, the self-righteous Israel would not be able to, to handle the truth of Jesus. Jesus. Israel was too rigid and unresponsive to, to carry the message to the world. And, and God himself would use the church to, uh, to accomplish this goal. I sometimes wonder if maybe over the, the past 2,000 years the, the church hasn't become too, too rigid as well. Sometimes we as Christians, we, we become too rigid. We become focused too much on religion. We become focused too much on tradition. Focused too much on programs. Too much on buildings. Focused too much on finances. Too much on our, our church image. We become focused too much on everything else except, except the message that, that Christ gave us to to take to the world the message the message of God's love the message of salvation the gospel message sometimes we we leave it on the doorstep as we focus on everything else question what are you focused on today Individually, what are you focused on today? Is your relationship with Christ even part of it? And I want you to think honestly about it. Because if it isn't, the rest of this means absolutely nothing. If your relationship if your relationship with Christ isn't right, your relationship with the church 
your relationship with the brothers and sisters, it isn't right either. It's nothing more than a show. It's nothing more than just being fake. It isn't doing you any good, and it isn't doing anybody else any good. So that's, that's where we need to start. That's where you need to start. And if that's, if that's where you are today, if that's where you are today, as you, as you think about your relationship with Christ, I'm guessing that right now the Holy Spirit is is probably speaking to you. And if that's the case at the same time, I, I know Satan is whispering in your ear. And he's saying, let it pass. It's just another sermon. It's another Sunday. You know, things have been pretty good. Why, why rock the boat now? You don't want to commit, you don't want to commit your, your life to Jesus. Every day? Commit your life to Jesus every day? Are you sure? Satan is a liar, my friends. He's a liar. Jesus says, I have something, I have something new for you. Something new for you. Not a patch on on your old life, but a new life. A new life. An abundant life. A glorious life with the Father. That's what I have. But you've got to let go. You've got to let go of that old life, that old tradition. God says, I have something new. Something radically different. If you just be a part of that, let us pray. Dear Father, I thank you again for your word this morning. And Lord, I just pray that as you speak to each one of us, Lord, just, just let us let us respond to your spirit. Let us just push Satan down and Ignore his temptation, his word. Let us rip that old patch off. Let us throw that old wineskin out and let us accept that, that new, that new life you promise us. I just thank you. Lord, I just praise you. Love you. And ask your continued care and blessings of this church. In Jesus' name, amen. As we prepare to sing our, our hymn invitation, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. This altar is open if you would like to come and pray. And again, if the Spirit is speaking to you this morning, if, you, if you've never known Christ as your Savior, there's not a better time than now. And if you're not where you need to be and you know you need to rip that patch off and just take on that new life that Christ offers, I encourage you to come and pray. As we stand and sing, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, page 292.
Oh, hearts and minds clear before we leave. All right. Amen. Let's, uh, let's bow for benediction. Father, again, we just thank you for this time together. Father, I just pray uh, your protection, your blessings upon each one here today. I, Lord, I just pray that you would go with each one of us as we, as we move uh, from your house out into the world. And, and Father, just let us carry that light of Christ. Father, let each one of us uh, meditate on your word and let each one of us, uh, Father, just grow in your love and your wisdom. We just thank you and we praise you. And Father, may all things glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen.